Please, that's very, very quiet. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for being here for what I think is a very important announcement. And let me introduce uh, Chairman um, Jeff Miller of the House of the A Committee. Um, this VA Conference Committee legislation that we are bringing forward today is far from what I would have written if I had to do it alone, and I suspect it's fair to say it is far from what uh, Chairman Miller would have done if he wrote this bill by himself. It is a compromise legislation. There's been give and take on both sides, and let me be very clear that I strongly support what we have come up with. This bill makes certain that we address the immediate crisis of veterans being forced onto long waiting lines for health care. It strengthens the VA so that it will be able to hire the doctors, nurses, and other medical personnel it needs so that we can put a permanent end to long waiting lists. It addresses the very serious problems of accountability and makes certain that dishonest and incompetent senior, senior officials at the VA do not remain employed there. And in addition, it provides some other significant benefits for veterans and their families. Funding for veterans' needs must be considered a cost of war and appropriated as emergency spending. Planes and tanks and guns are a cost of war. So is taking care of the men and women who use those weapons and who fight our battles. Uh, this was the funding mechanism contained in the Sanders-McCain bill. Uh, which passed the Senate with 93 votes, and it is the funding mechanism in, in this bill. Sufficient sums of money must be provided so that the VA has the resources to immediately end unacceptably long waiting periods in many VA facilities throughout the country. This bill does that by contra contracting out with private medical providers, uh, community health centers, Department of uh, Defense facilities, etc. and this is something that was contained in the House uh, bill. And we basically accept that language. This agreement, consistent uh, with the Sanders-McCain bill, allows veterans who live 40 miles or more from the VA facility to get their health care outside of the VA. And I think what we appreciate, if you live 100 miles away and you're sick, you should not have to make that long trip. You should be able to go to a provider in your community. This bill, in terms of dollars, provides uh, some $10 billion for contracting out of health care and for those veterans who live 40 miles or more away, $10 billion. Uh, Acting VA Secretary uh, Sloan Gibson and many of the veterans organizations have made it clear that we need to uh, make sure the VA has the doctors, the nurses, the medical personnel, and the space they need. This bill provides $5 billion for the VA to strengthen uh, their capabilities. Uh, this legislation, consistent with bills passed in the House, I think unanimously, and in the Senate as part of Sanders-McCain, authorizes funding for the VA to enter into 27, uh, into leases at 27 major facilities in 18 states in Puerto Rico. That will cost about a billion and a half dollars. Uh, we have all been outraged by uh, the distortion of data and so forth. This bill contains language which will allow the secretary to fire people immediately who are doing, uh, who are underperforming or lying. Uh, it gives them a 21-day period of appeal without pay during that period. Uh, this bill also contains some other provisions uh, included in Sanders-McCain. Uh, it improves uh, delivery of care to veterans who experience sexual trauma while serving in the military. It expands the John David Price Scholarship Program to include surviving spouses of members of the armed forces who died in the line of duty. And it also lets all veterans qualify for in-state tuition under the post-9-11 GI Bill. And it also extends the program uh, regarding TBI. Uh, in terms of money, uh, this bill will provide $17 billion into VA health care. There's a $5 billion offset within the VA, approximately $12 billion of new money. So this has been a very difficult process. And it takes place, Chairman Miller and I are working within the context uh, philosophically, the House and the Senate being very different institutions, looking at the world very differently. A lot of partisanship going on. It has been a very, very difficult process. And I want to thank 
Chairman Miller very much. I think from day one he understood that it is absolutely imperative that we get this bill done and we get it done now before the August break. It certainly would not have happened without his determination and his hard work, and I thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you very much to my friend, uh, the chairman of the, the Senate committee. Uh, goes without saying, we have a VA that is in crisis today. This agreement will go a long way to helping resolve the crisis that exists out there today. Helping to get veterans off of waiting lists is extremely important, and this bill does that. It also holds people within the department accountable. And that's something that both bodies uh, wanted to do. If I'd have written this, uh, the secretary would have had the ability to fire uh, the top senior level individuals without an appeal. Senator Sanders wanted an appeal in there, and this is a compromise uh, that we've been able to, to reach. Uh, we have been working on this diligently from the days that this has passed both bodies. The fact that there had been little action or movement for a long period of time, I think, was exaggerated. Uh, Senator Sanders and I, uh, among other members of the conference committees, have worked very diligently to try to bring this uh, into closure before we left for the August recess. And that has always been the deadline that we had set to be able to get this bill passed by both houses before we went home. The other thing it does is it starts a conversation, I think, about VA for the future. Senator Sanders and I differ about certain things, but one thing that we do agree about is that the veterans of this country deserve the best quality health care that they can get in a timely fashion, and that has not been the case as of late. As I said in my opening statement with Acting Secretary Gibson in our committee the other day, uh, the VA is not sacred. The veteran is. And that's the most important thing for all of us to remember as we have gone through this process. Uh, we still have to have it appeal, uh, approved uh, by the conference committee and then, of course, both houses. The House leaves on Thursday, the Senate, I believe, on Friday. So that, I say thank you to my good friend, Senator Sanders, uh, for working in good faith uh, throughout the entire process, and I look forward to moving this in the House. How do you keep costs from spiraling out of control when suddenly thousands of veterans are getting their health care outside the system? Well, we both have different answers, I'm sure. <laughs> I'd love to hear both. Well, not going into a, a philosophical debate, what this legislation is doing is appropriating $10 billion for veterans who are currently enrolled in the VA, both to get emergency care. If they go to a facility and there's a long waiting line, they're going to go to a private doctor, community health center, or else. In addition to that, there is money available that if you're living more than 40 miles away, you will be able to get the health care you need in your community. We've got $10 billion appropriated. It may well be uh, that at some point in the future we will need more money, and that's the debate we're going to have to have when we cross that bridge. And, and I would say that, that again, the, the biggest issue that we had to confront was the CBO score uh, that was given on both the House and the Senate bill. Uh, as we began the, the strong negotiations, we went to the Senate bill, which was $35 billion, uh, and I don't believe any of us believe that, that it's going to cost that much. Right. And so what the House said uh, as we began talking uh, with the Senator was, we believe it will be less than the first year cost of $10 billion. Uh, and we're willing to lock that number in, uh, and it will continue as long as that money uh, is right. there. Uh, I don't believe that there will be a, a flight of all of the veterans out of the system, but we don't know uh, until we start this program uh, to see how veterans are actually going to act. And this first year uh, is going to give us a good benchmark with which to be able to set the future uh, of this program forward. The other thing I think that, that we all agree on is that the, the one of the important things in our bill was to have a commission that would go through and independently look at the Department of Veterans Affairs from top to bottom. The VA will tell us they need more money and more people, but that what they won't do uh, is help us understand what efficiencies can be found within the system. 
Are doctors seeing patients as they should? Is their space being used adequately? Do they need to close and only see people during the normal business hours? So there are a lot of things that we're going to find out in the next year uh, that hopefully will change the way VA delivers health care. And let me just add to that. I agree with what the <coughs> chairman said. Uh, in addition, we hope uh, that with more doctors and nurses and space coming in, the VA system itself will be able to accommodate more veterans in a timely manner. Yes, sir. I guess this question is actually a two-part question. Most of us know it. You can certainly weigh in here. That's if you said you don't believe that there will be a flight of folks out of the system. How, how are you assured that people will come back into the system? And then the second part of this, and you talked about the trouble with the CBO score here, is it still this price tag is pretty hefty. Will that be able to fly in the House of Representatives and there where, where you have so many Tea Party conservatives concerned about that bottom line? I believe it will. Uh, as we discussed in our conference throughout this process, taking care of our veterans is not an inexpensive proposition, and our members understand that. This is not a process in which we found ourselves because of Congress's lack of oversight, because oversight is what actually brought this to the table. Uh, we have a serious problem that needs to be resolved. The VA has caused this problem, and one of the ways that we can help solve it is to give veterans a choice, a choice to stay in the system or a choice to go out of the system. There may be folks that actually will not come back into the system. They may want to stay. There are a lot of veterans that don't go to the VA right now because they have the ability to seek their health care somewhere else. Uh, and I think uh, we will begin to see what that number is. VA always says 90% plus of the people in the system are satisfied, well, here's a great way to test it, because if they are, you would expect 90% will stay in the system. Congressman Miller? Sir, I wonder if I could ask you, <clears throat> is the $10 billion offset? Or no, the no, the, the $10 billion is mandatory emergency money. Uh, the additional money, uh, we do have offsets, and if additional money is needed, it will have to be done through the normal appropriations process subject to the BCA caps. So why are you allowing the deficit to rise in this case? Because the veterans need quick response, uh, and this is the way that we need to be able to make sure that veterans are not standing in line as they have been. And let me tell you something. It doesn't matter what Senator Sanders or I or our conference committee passes, we can't legislate good morals and good character. And as long as people are inside the system, that are willing to gain the numbers as they have in the past, VA is not going to be able uh, to fix itself. And so hopefully, as we both have talked with the incoming secretary, uh, he will be able to make the change that is necessary from the top. Sure. Well, Senator Sanders, uh, you, you had mentioned that about, about $5 billion of this will be, will be offset. Where are those offsets coming from? Is it coming from within the, uh, the, all, VA within the all within the VA. And then, so the other, the other part of it, you mentioned. So it's going to be $12 about $12 billion of new spending and $5 billion offset from other programs in the VA, which I feel comfortable with. And, and the $12 billion is, is, the is all emergency funding. Yes. <coughs> Do you think yes, the compromise can change the culture inside the VA? Well, let me answer that. Um, right now, and I hope this week, within the next few days, Bob McDonald is going to be. Uh, voted upon as the new Secretary of the VA. I have a lot of confidence uh, in Bob McDonald. Uh, Sloan Gibson will remain on as Deputy Secretary. So we have a new team in there. Uh, and I hope very much that the VA fully understands that some of what we have seen and heard about in the last few months is this is not a political issue. This is unacceptable for any and every member of the United States Congress. There's not going to be manipulation of data. It's not going to be lying about waitlist. There's going to be a better relationship between Congress uh, and the VA. They're going to provide information to us uh, when we need that information. Uh, I want to say with I believe, and I've said this many, many times, and I think it's absolutely true in Vermont, and I think it's true in many parts of this country, that when veterans get into the VA system, they feel pretty good about the quality of care that they are getting. I hear this all of the time. Problem we're having with access, we're going to deal with it right now, short term, with emergency care, people going to private doctors and so forth. Longer term, I hope the VA will have the doctors, nurses, and the culture to make sure that every eligible veteran in this country gets timely and quality health care when he or she needs it. Sure. Sir? Uh, and I 
know Chairman Milley was suggesting that we shouldn't read too much into the delay here, but give us a sense of what really was the, the biggest sticking point. I mean, you could have done this two weeks ago, you could have done it last huh. week. What took until today to get it done? Well, let me just, please, uh, you know, Let's be clear. I, I don't know if Chairman Miller would use the word. The United States Congress today, in my view, is a dysfunctional institution. Uh, there are major issue after major issue where virtually nothing is happening when important legislation needs to be happening. So rather than go through why we didn't do this a month ago and get it done, the important point is we are here together, having done something that happens quite rarely in the United States Congress. So I'm proud of what we have accomplished. Jeff, you want to add anything to that? Uh, you, as you mentioned in your original bill, uh, you didn't have this 21 day review period. Are you worried that this compromise is going to allow for too much red tape and bureaucracy? Together? No, uh, the, way it, the way it will be written is that when the uh, secretary makes the decision to fire uh, someone, uh, they will immediately be fired and they lose their salary at that point. They will have a one week period in which to appeal, and the board will then have a 21 day period in which they can review it, and if they don't do their job within a 21-day period, then the firing is upheld. That is exactly right, and it's something, a sentiment I, I share. We do not want a repeals process going on month after month, year after year. But is there a concern then that uh, they're taking away their salaries before they have a chance to be processed? Well, look, we, we can, yeah. I'm sure the people have that concern. And so this is the compromise that we reached. I think it's a reason. Senator, Senator, you mentioned this was a short-term fix in terms of going to the outside care. Is there a specific, you know, sunset on this provision? In other words, it goes for two years and then that's it, or is it going to be re-extended, or, or how does that work? Well, so we can't talk about what happens in the future. There's now a three-year uh, sunset. Talking about the wait times in the bill that trigger um, allowing veterans right. to seek outside care, and have you have you left that to the current wait time defined by the VA, right? And it, so the VA. That's what the House had. Uh, the Senate had 30 days, and we are uh, going with the Senate 30 day. Okay. Is this replacing ARCH? Uh, ARCH will be continued uh, for two years. I know the veterans are important. I know the House people. You know that they're important. But specifically, how are you planning on selling this when it's mostly not offset, which is something that House Republicans have said that they don't they don't support broadly. I come from a sales background before I came to Congress, <laughs> and, and I think I can do an adequate job. Can you explain how? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I. We will be able to sell it to our conference. We will probably not get a unanimous vote as we did as the bill was coming out of the House. Senator Sanders talks about 93 to 3. Ours was 425 to nothing. Uh, so, so he's you know, always trying to one up me. <laughs> <laughs> as, as we go through the, the process, um, there will be an educational process that will have to take place. Obviously, uh, some of our members will need a little more educating than others. And I, I would say this that, you know, at the end of the day, whether you're a conservative Republican or a progressive, uh, people understand uh, that this issue should and must go beyond politics, that we have people who have put their lives on the line, people who have come back with a whole lot of problems, and it would be an absolute disgrace to this country if we did not address their needs. So I think there's going to be widespread support Mr. for Chairman, this legislation. Yes. Uh, on the process, um, when do you expect the conference committee to vote and who, what chamber do you expect to go first? I think we, are, we want to get this thing done as quickly as possible, so we're still working out that mechanism. But I think it would be, it'd be appropriate to say that we hope to have everything done by the end of the day uh, in regards to uh, the conference committee signing off on the report. Uh, and then the mechanism as to who goes first uh, is not as critical uh, as other pieces of this and putting it together. Um, I will step out and say the House probably will go first, but that hasn't been decided yet. And my view is who goes first is important. The important thing is that we get this done as quickly as possible and we do this before we recess. Uh, yes, ma'am. Chairman, um, uh, Senator Sanders, you said that uh, your view is that Congress is a dysfunctional institution. There's nothing getting done with important legislation. Did I say that? You did. Oh. You did say that. Um, not focusing on the, how long it may have taken to get this done, but going just from last week's to this week, there was a pretty tense moment at the end of last week 
Can you give us a sense of what it took to get here? It could be instructive for... Look, this... Okay, look, these... You know, the Congress is, is very divided right now. And the House has its views, and the Senate has its views, and Jeff and I have to work through these things. And I think at the end of the day, what's important is that he understood, and I, and I understood, this is not Democrats and Republicans or Independents. This is the veterans of the United States of America, and we have a moral obligation to do it, and we do it. There has not been one time that Senator Sanders nor our staffs have continued to communicate. Uh, a lot of the media made uh, hay out of what took place uh, last week, uh, but we continue to negotiate. Uh, even as that day was unfolding, uh, we were communicating. Okay, one or two more questions. All right, yes, ma'am. Um, there were members of the Pennsylvania delegation who had been seeking to have some uh, measures put in this um, conference committee report um, regarding infectious disease reporting. Can you talk about if that was part of the conversation at all and what happened to that proposal? I'm not sure that that is in this. It was not part of this conference uh, report. However, we both uh, agree uh, that uh, some of the issues, specifically in Pittsburgh, uh, and other places around the country uh, will not stand, and we must uh, try to resolve uh, the veil of secrecy uh, that caused uh, the issue to crop up in, in Pittsburgh. And let me just a add to what Chairman Miller said. Look, this is not the end. This is the beginning. Um, we are dealing now with the crisis situation, and I think we have done good work in addressing the crisis. But God knows there's a lot more work to be done in many, many areas, so we've got to keep going and doing that. All right? All right. Thank you all very, thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. you.